Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Digital Forensics Files podcast. It is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, the month of October, and I've got a cybersecurity lawyer and data privacy lawyer with me. Uh, I met Sarah Anderson on LinkedIn, like I have several of my guests, because it's a, it's a unique and interesting community that we have, and we all sort of connect in, in, in forums like that. And uh, Sarah caught my eye because she's really been producing some amazing content. She started up uh, the cybersecurity blog, uh, sorry, the Law Cyber blog uh, at uh, la cyberlogblog.com did i say log blog sorry it's la cyber law blog really great content um sarah you're uh you're a lawyer in louisiana welcome to the show thanks for taking up the time yeah thank you so much for having me i'm excited i love yeah. talking to anyone else as paranoid as i am it makes me feel like great <laughs> I think the world's getting more and more paranoid, and, and some of the recent uh, Netflix specials, if you know what I'm talking about, has, has caused an, an extra level, at least in my world, of paranoia with the, yes. with the, with the advent of the social dilemma, uh, which I, which I um, had the pleasure of watching last night. Frankly, I found it a little underwhelming. Have you seen that one? I started watching it, and I think I had the same reaction you did because I fell asleep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think it's an important... I think we wouldn't have found it underwhelming if we weren't in the roles that we are in. Agreed. Yeah. So a lot of it terribly wasn't surprising. The effects of what they're talking about was appalling to me. Like when they started talking about um, young girls and preteen suicide rates and self-harm, um, I didn't realize there was that the statistics were so uh, conclusive of the damage from online uh, interaction with social media for young women. And that really you know, alarmed me. Um, but over, overall, um, I thought the content, it's not stuff that I didn't already know. And the irony of that, I think I found myself drifting away and checking my phone during the, during the show, <laughs> uh, which is a, a, a mild alternative second place win to uh, falling asleep altogether. But uh, I made it through, I, I suppose. But um, anyways, enough about me. Sarah, you're a lawyer first, and then you're into this whole cybersecurity thing, and you've got a really interesting background in that, which I want to cut even before that which I want to touch on, but let's just talk about your journey into law. What caused you to sort of be aware of the law and want to go into that as a career and as an educational choice? Uh, basically because I was at the University of Georgia, which is like, it's just a big state school, deep down South, big party school, had great time there. And I was like a poli sci major or something. And my dad told me, he's like, well, what are you going to do with this? And I was like, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'll be getting like a history teacher or something. I don't know. Um, and he was like, you need to do something like you don't realize, but you have to support yourself at some point, like legitimately, I think you should go to law school. And I was like, oh, OK, I guess that seems like a decent idea. Um, so that's how I sort of forced got my way into that career uh, choice. I wish it was a, a better story, but well, and I had a friend growing up whose father was a lawyer and mm -hmm. they always went on cool vacations, you know. So, I mean, classic teenage girl approach to life. That, well, I wouldn't say classic, but it's very interesting. And it's, it's not maybe to you, not the greatest story, but it, to me, it's really interesting because it's not the classic model of people who go into law school. These are generally people who are very driven and focused on achieving goals that are very specific. So I love that you kind of flew by the seat of your pants and were like, yeah, I'll do this. So um, did you find that that was different from most people's attitude? It's a really weird environment in law school. It's hyper competitive. Um, yes. Hyper driven uh, by type A personalities and, and things like that. So you well, very much I'm not very type A. So it, I mean, it kind of fit, it fit my personality completely and I'm very competitive by nature. And I also understood the economics of, I think the world maybe better than some of my peers did. And mm -hmm. so in the sense that like, you know, my parents were always very upfront with me that like, you have to be able to sustain your own life. And I realized that I needed a career that would provide opportunity for me to do that. You know, mm -hmm. not all, all lawyers make a bunch of money. I actually make, will make less money this year than I have in years past. Uh, so, I mean, it's not about necessarily the um, making a lot of money, but being able to sustain yourself and mm -hmm. having that independence and having a career also that will, or an educational background that can evolve with you. So like, you don't always have to do just one thing, right? Um, right. You have an entire right. You want to go into business, you know, you can go into business. If you want to um, go into a more technical side of the world, like I have, you can, mm -hmm. if you want to be a traditional litigator or prosecutor or defense attorney, or, you know, there's just a lot of different options. Right. Um, at least there was in my mind back then. So it seemed like a good fit. And I was uh, terrified of blood and guts. And so being a doctor wasn't really, you know, 
on the table. That's a fair comment, fair comment, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, did you sort of know early on in law school which direction you wanted to go in terms of being a solicitor versus a courtroom lawyer? Um, I kind of flip-flopped back and forth the entire time. I couldn't really decide what I wanted to do. It, and one thing I've noticed with the law, I, I really believe that this is probably um, true of everything. If you find the right people to work with, you're going to enjoy what you're doing. Um, it's really the law. You have to think about like working in a law firm and working with law partners almost as like you would approach any other relationship, like romantic relations, like a marriage, in the sense that like you have to really make sure you're compatible with each other. And if you're compatible with the people you're working with, you're going to enjoy that experience regardless of what the content is. In my, and that's just my humble opinion. Uh, yeah, so no, I it's spot on. <laughs> uh, sorry, can you say that last part again? Sure. I, I found sort of my, my little my little group for a while, and I really enjoyed working with them, and I liked going to work every day. So they could have said, we're digging ditches today, and I probably would have just grabbed a shovel, you know, um, and said we were doing litigation. <laughs> that's Hey, it worked out well, then. That's great. I, you're, the firm that you're at now is a bit of a mouthful. It's Alexander Sides, Brinson, Spot, and Mullins, LLC. Um, very <laughs> traditional sounding law firm. Um, but I love it's anything it's, but traditional, but yes, it sounds that way. <laughs> right. No, only the name only is what I was referencing, but yeah, I agree. And, and the description on the website is really cool. And it's just what you said, which is that it's a group of friends that are licensed to practice law. I don't think I've ever seen a law firm, um, describe themselves as a group of friends. I think that's really wonderful. It sounds like you actually have that culture at your firm. Yeah, it's, it's very casual. It's, um, you know, you do whatever you want to do. Uh, so when I first got here, you know, I'd kind of taken a long road to get here. And in mm -hmm. fact, but the person who brought me on here and asked me to come aboard um, was actually the first person who hired me at the old big law firm that I used to work at. Oh, okay, um, okay. And he had left big law to kind of do his own thing and just convinced me to come with him. And so when I got here, he had already hired a bunch of his golf buddies and friends. And mm -hmm. um, I will tell you, people are in this office in athleisure wear. I don't think I've ever seen anyone in a suit. Uh, they're playing putt putt in the hallways. I mean, there's a bar. It's it's great. <laughs> that sounds great, and it's very. Uh, it's they're, they're, most law firms seem to be moving away from the traditional stuffy mold. Um, I noticed when I do pre presentations at law firms, I used to wear you know suit and tie and stuff like that. I was always the most overdressed person in the room, uh, which which isn't great. Um, so yeah, and it's cool. You don't have to do it if you're not seeing clients or whatever. Be comfortable. Do your job. You're working long hours and working very hard, so it makes sense. Now, you've been at this firm since January 2020, is that correct? Yes. Uh, I was in-house for a year, a little less than a year before I came over here. So I started here full-time in January 2020. And awesome. I, I like it. Yeah, congrats on the move. And you also um, you, you also then kind of trended into your current uh, area of practice. Is that fair to say? Is that when you transitioned into yeah. cybersecurity? Yes. So I've been doing cybersecurity law work since 2017, very end of 2017. And I was doing some of that on the side at my old big law firm. And, but that wasn't the practice group I was in. And I was, it was one of these things where you're trying to say like, Hey, this is the future. Let's invest mm -hmm. um, personnel time, whatever. And they kind of were like, well, maybe, uh, but we still need you to do your 2000 hours of toxic tort litigation. <laughs> um, and I was like, uh, okay. And then when I was on, um, I had a, I had a, I had my third and final child, I guess, like a few months later. And while I was on maternity leave, you know, he, he slept well. So I just started doing more research on my own and really, really got into it. And then about six months after that, decided to go in-house for a technology nonprofit company. They did sort of cyber law work. But when I got there, I realized they were doing a lot more government contracts. Um, okay. And I don't know. I just don't, didn't feel like that was really what I wanted to do after all. I really wanted to kind of see what I could do with mm -hmm. cybersecurity law. And it was a chance to kind of, you know, for once in, you know, such a advanced modern age of society, like kind of be in the wild, wild west and see what happens, you know, see what you can influence and see what you think and actually have room to like, you know, really leave your mark. Yeah. hundred percent. You are already. A, it's caught my eye up way here up in Canada. So good job. You're, you're producing great content that, as I mentioned, before we go into what you're what you're doing now, uh, take me back to the first file where you were involved in this kind of thing, and, and what was that like, and what surprised you uh, about working on that kind of a file? Um, like first civilian file, I would say was probably just a just contractual just work, just dry, drafting their uh, contracts. But what I found interesting is they were using Amazon Web Services to sort of start this like document. Um, I want to say repository for clients. In other words, kind of build their own cloud almost underneath um, AWS. 
and just seeing how all that worked. And then I remember I was researching the AWS website because they were going to be marketing internationally. And this is before, you know, the privacy shields were invalidated, um, which just happened like right a few months ago. Uh, and I remember reading all about this. And I was like, gosh, I was like, how is this all going to fit together in a puzzle? Like, mm-hmm. you know, you've got different rules with different companies. I mean, different entities, you know, this either needs to, to, meet, to fuse or it's going to really break up international business on an e-commerce level. Um, and so that was sort of where, you know, so I'm supposed to be writing this contract and meanwhile, I'm like distracted by all these other things going on. Um, right. and I've been doing a lot of incident response with my role in the national guard, um, right. and drafting legislation for that. And so that predated more of the contractual work. Right. Right. Interesting how you foresaw the need to, um, get a hold of the issues before they get out of hand because technology and business are both progressing infinitely, like in, uh, exponentially, I should say. Oh, yeah. But, you know, they're not necessarily congruent all the time and they're going in different directions. And unless somebody's really, really aware, it's complicated to put everything together and understand the issues that could, uh, a business could run into. So I like that you had that forefront um, to go into that. Um, now, a lot of your content, uh, you, you have a blog, as we mentioned, and I'll put the, uh, the, the link in the, uh, the notes and all the, all the things on YouTube. But, um, you know, you, you do a lot of good good content that's really uh, valid and, and very uh, modern and, and up to date in terms of the issues. And I, I've i been following your blog for a while and I, I really like it, obviously. But um, your, your latest post is interesting to me because... Um, it's, it's about the Department of Treasury and their move to potentially sanction people who are paying ransoms after a ransomware. And I love that people are trying to do something new to stop the payment, but I'm, I question if this is the right move. And your article sets out the issues very, <laughs> very um, succinctly and properly while being quite interesting to read. You make a lot of great analogies. Um, in, in your article, it's just a really great read. So, so tell me about your article and tell the people who are listening about uh, why you wrote it and what, it, what it's uh, contents are. Oh, well, thank you. Well, I, thank you for saying succinct. I would say abrupt. Um, <laughs> abrasively approach the matter, which is just my background. Um, but, you know, I read that and I had it sent to me by a couple other people on LinkedIn saying, what do you think about this? And I had heard about it. And I don't know if you can tell if you've been watching my blog, but the content has slowed down because I've just been in a big response that I've been dealing with since uh, before summer. So I've just been really distracted. But that caught my attention quite a bit because on one hand, I was like, well, when you pay ransom and I'm not passing judgment because I really try to stay as neutral as possible on these issues to assert to the extent that I can without compromising intellectual integrity. But um I think about it and I'm like, well, paying ransom, most people don't realize what they're funding, right? All the things that sort of um, just keep you up at night, especially if you're a parent. uh, And I really find that that just affects, I don't know if you're a parent, Tyler, but um, it just affects the way you think. Are you a parent? I have a fur baby. I'm a four-legged dog parent. Well, still, I mean, you're, you're still there. Um, I'm very much a believer in fur babies or things. You're funding (laughs) these horrible, you know, uh, crimes that affect every aspect of society and you just don't know it. You know, it's almost mm-hmm. like if you got onto a GoFundMe page and we're like, who wants to help fund the next ring of human traffickers? Like, oh, I'd love to, like, here's a hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, it's almost like that, but you just don't know. And right. that's sort of, and so I understand um, the Department of Treasury and their office, um, the OFSA's decision to want to bring that to everybody's attention that like, this is not just a criminal that you're funding and they're buying Mountain Dew and hoodie sweatshirts, you know? Yeah. Yeah. are, you know, this is not, you're not just funding some pimple faced kid in a dark closet somewhere. Mm-hmm. You are you're funding legitimate organized crime and the nation states that are openly hostile to the U S you yeah. are helping support their economy. Like I think North Korea, I was reading an article that was put out by the MSI. It was either the MSI sack or the secret service that was saying one third of North Korea's GDP um, gross domestic product is ransomware payments. Unbelievable. I mean, Not surprising, that, but yeah, it's shocking. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, their economy is so stunted because they lived in they live in this vacuum, and that's one way. There's the fur baby. Um, yes, <laughs> she's lurking about. <laughs> um, you know, you just don't realize what you're doing, and so you're funding that. But at the same time, you know, 
the U.S. government, and I think every foreign government that is actively engaged in trying to get control of the cybercrime problem, has to open the doors for information sharing between its public sector and its government, I mean, private sector and its government. Mm -hmm. In other words, you need the big companies to share threat information with you. And if you put out something like an advisory saying, we're going to start sanctioning you if we find out that you knowingly paid a ransom associated with an actor that is on this bad actor list. Um, essentially, they're trying to enforce their export laws on software, essentially, in the ransomware world. Um, we're going to find you. And you're sitting there looking, thinking about this going, on one hand, your, uh, your goal was pure, but your execution was poor. Um, yep. In the sense that you didn't think about this from a private sector standpoint. What I see happening is not just the need for information sharing on um, defensive measures and indicators of compromise, but there needs to be some sort of information sharing, almost bringing on private sector consultants to the Fed to think about these things from the opposite end of the aisle before you go ahead and issue them. Because all that did for anybody, I feel like, especially insurance companies is say, well, we'll just have to find a way to disguise the payments. Yeah, and no, hundred percent. Exactly. Um, and, and the other, the other thing that I got, the other takeaway that I got from your article is that there's a double victimization that goes on when you punish the victim of a crime. This is a crime that happens to people and they don't, they don't intentionally pay like you identified. They don't know who they're paying the money to. And in my opinion, if they did, they'd still do it because they're in such a bad situation. It's not a, it's not a fair playing field. They're not making this decision, you know, consciously going into it as, as an even kind of negotiated deal. They're desperate and they'll pay anything to anyone to get their business up and running. Um, it's, it's, it's not fair, in my opinion, to, to victimize the victim further. So I think, I think it's a good start to try and pay attention to something, but it's, it's, probably going to miss the mark. And what is the status of it, by the way? Is it actually, is there actually a policy that's been implemented by yeah. the Treasury? They went ahead and issued guidelines. I tried to pull the guidelines up and it said page not found. I did it for a couple of, mm. a couple of different times. So my guess is they're still undergoing revision. Essentially, they're saying is they're going to use existing laws as a warning to say we could sanction you. They say um, they haven't actually issued I, what I can see is formal firm guidelines on that. I think mm -hmm. it's all sort of still wishy-washy. Um, so I wonder if this was almost like a warning shot right. uh, to the community. I, I don't usually work with the, you know, I work sometimes with various federal entities through the guard and, you know, whatever it else we're, we're working on. I've never worked with the Department of Treasury before. I can't imagine they want to work with me after this. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I've never worked with them or had the opportunity to uh, speak to them. So I can't tell you what their mindset would be other than they probably just want to let people know. I don't know if this was sort of like a public campaign to say, hey, to let the public know, like, this is what you're funding and there are real consequences to this, which uh, I mean, I understand uh, most people don't grasp what they're doing. And especially from a double victimization level, you've got and I think this is the analogy I use, but it's, it's I feel like it's almost worse than the analogy I use, which is you basically just took the victim of a carjacking. And then penalize them for handing over their vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And now you're asking for their wallet so or, you know, yes. or placing a lien on their home. If there's just no, there's no good way to do that. And all you're doing is further convincing the ransomware victims to stay in the dark about what they experienced. Right. And them staying in the dark about what they experienced leads to bigger problems, I think, than funding the ransomware itself. Yeah, um, I agree. I, have I, I love that. I love that line in your article. Sorry to cut you off, but you, um, yeah, it's such a great line and it really jumped out at me in reading your entire article. It's, it's essentially demanding a wallet from a person who just suffered a carjacking. Yeah. You, you nailed it there. That's, that's exactly what it's like. Uh, so good job. But it seems to me the effort should be on um, companies preventing being in the position to have to pay the ransom, uh, which would be education and, and a whole bunch of ways you can target that and improve that situation. Um, and then also going to have better policies to be able to identify the perpetrator seems to me where we should be focusing on it. Why should somebody be able to have an anonymous cryptocurrency wallet? Somebody should have to verify who they are and where they are and, and why, you know, the whole IP thing drives me nuts because that's the only way we can identify people on the internet. And it's very easy to disguise and it's very hard to get the information that everybody has. So. I don't understand why there is the level of anonymity on the internet that we have. I mean, I understand from a consumer perspective that we don't want to be targeted and identified for 
social ads and, and all these kind of things. But on the other side of it, there's so much damage being uh, happening in the world because people are allowed to be anonymous, whether it's stalking people online, um, whether it's bad Google reviews that are fake and you can't do anything about it because only Google has the IP address and that may or may not reveal somebody's identity. And then you input the whole cybercrime aspect. These people are just getting away with it because they know that they're not going to get identified. Yeah, I mean, there's very few stories of individuals being apprehended. Right. Um, I think Ukraine, um, I believe, I guess it was a month ago, they arrested two people in some sort of heist. I mean, not to be ugly, but you kind of have to be really dumb to get busted or very flagrant about what you're doing. In other words, not care if right. you get you get busted. I mean, anybody, anybody can download, um, mm -hmm. not download, excuse me, log on through a Tor browser, get on protonmail.com mm -hmm. and set up an account. And ProtonMail does have um, authentication. You know, they'll either ask for another email address so that they can at least, um, what they say, and I, right. I don't know if I believe them, but I might, is that they can at least do email account recovery through your other email. Um, but you can almost set those things up totally anonymously. And in the mobile app, you can actually do it totally anonymously without any type of, you know, link back to who you are. And then all you have to do is, get in your proton mail account through a separate VPN, you know, yeah. but you can buy a VPN on the internet, virtual private network for what 50 bucks. That's good. That actually will work. And right. they will route your traffic through 186 different countries before it lands on where it's going to go. And so yeah. you could be anywhere in the world um, and route it through, you know, any type of encrypted air uh, network and no one will ever know where it came from. I know it's, it's interesting. And, and the whole VPN thing is fascinating to me because the legitimate use it, it's hailed as a security measure that people should be using to encrypt your data while it's in transit and all these kind of things but on the flip side of the coin it's one of the most predominantly used tools to disguise your identity by everyone and it's easy to use and it's easy to get and there's there's a number of service providers that, that do it so it, it's quite there's so many levels to this problem which is why i find the field so fascinating it's a real you know cat and mouse game we're all playing yeah, and I think that's why if you focus on, you know, what can we do to de-identify, to identify these people and remove their anonymity, I feel like they're going, before you even catch up to them, they're going to have another level because there is no end to this. This is almost like outer space, right? Like there's no vacuum. Um, you know, if you think about it in terms of another, another industry like cars, right? Um, and what makes them a car versus an airplane is they have to stay on a road. So you know that there is a box that the car has to stay in is that it's got to be on a road and it's got to be able to go, you know, from certain places and it's a physical body. This we're talking about, it's totally virtual. There's no tangible presence, nothing you can touch. And the limits are only as far as the mind, because yeah. this is, there is no physicality of it. And they're like, there's nothing kinetic about it that you can control. So mm -hmm. I think that's why when people focus on, well, how do we focus on, how do we get to the anonymity aspect and, um, correct that. I think it's almost, I don't want to say a fruitless effort because nothing is really fruitless when you're presume, pursuing a solution because you usually learn so much in the process. But I think the focus really has to be on preparing companies and entities to deal with it. Um, like there's no, that's why when I think there, of the double victimization aspect uh, is that having a company say, okay, so if I tell you I paid a ransom or you find out, which I don't even know how they would find out unless it's reported on financial statements, like Sarbanes-Oxley is going to turn that stuff over. Um, so there are ways in which publicly traded companies will definitely be found out. Um, but you're going to just force people to go underground about it, and then yeah. you can have a whole other set of falsified returns. So I think the only way to go about it is, is offer free tools to those who report it, because then you can at least start to identify trends in the groups and what they're facing. Um, and I think that is so important uh, is that they understand how this potentially occurred. There's never going to be a situation where someone is foolproof. It's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. We can all take all the measures that we want. And at some point, at some time in the future, someone is going to figure out how to penetrate those. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't go ahead and make those defenses on your own. Right. Um, and try to stock up and just teaching people basic ways because it's really not complicated, right? I mean, you can buy a $50 hard drive from Best Buy that's two terabytes and plug it in each night and back up your data. Yeah. You know, because yeah. then all you have to do when you get encrypted, right, is re-image your machine. 
Very true. That's absolutely right. And yeah, and then it's over, right? On then you just reload all your software, swipe out, change all your credentials, and you're maybe out two days of operations, but you have this disk, you know, this hard drive that you can stick in a safe. Um, it's it's so fascinating I, that you say that. I, I literally inside, I'm like, thank you, because the irony of ransomware is it's the most prevalent and the biggest threat to businesses and government and everybody else, and it's so damaging. But it's the, also the most easily to prevent. Like if you just have a good backup, you'll be fine. It's just okay. You know, and you still have to do forensics, in my opinion, to figure out when when the yeah. incident occurred, and you still have to you know, figure out the timing as to when to roll back your data to. But I mean, for God's sakes, and you do something. And, and when I hear people that have a backup, but it also got encrypted, and you're not going far enough, you're not working with the right people who are knowledgeable enough to, to remove your backup from the, the same yeah, level. Or they, <laughs> yeah, or they keep the backup on the same network. And you're like, that's, that's what I mean, yeah. You missed, yeah, you just missed the point here. Yeah. It's gotta be totally mm -hmm. separate. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, I love your, your message is the same of all, as all of us uh, in the community up here and worldwide. So I, I love the support and, and the content that you're doing. Before I let you go, I want to touch on your, your technical background. Does it have something to do with your background in the, uh, the reserve, the, the Louisiana Guard in the Army? I actually, um, I don't have a huge technical background. I've had to learn it, I learn a lot of what I'm doing um, on the fly. It's almost like an old fashioned apprenticeship um, that mm -hmm. they used to do before everybody started going to college, right? Uh, yeah. I work almost exclusively with tech experts. Right. I would say I am the only one in any room ever that is not a CISSP, that is not a network engineer, a software engineer, a coder, um, information security expert on the tech side. Mm -hmm. I am only, you know, I basically, I almost call myself like a nerd babysitter. Um, <laughs> and I literally just work, I work alongside them and mm -hmm. I, you know, they have to explain to me what they're doing because I have to make sure that they're not inadvertently violating any type of privacy laws. You know, especially when you're a public agency, you don't want to be accused of providing one um, set of resources, but not another set to somebody else that's equal because then you face discrimination issues. Um, right. So there's all sorts of little issues, problems that built into that. Um, but just being with them for the last three years, I have just learned so much. And I would say the biggest takeaway for anybody that is worried about, you know, being encrypted or being hacked or whatnot is to constantly change your passwords, enable that two factor authentication on any service that you use the moment it becomes available. You know, use your cell phone. Cell phones are surprisingly resilient. I um, yeah, they are. You know, because they have to be. Yeah, um, use your cell phone. You know, I think I paid forty eight dollars for my last malware license that covered five devices. Yeah. You know, and it works fine. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. And then also have that you know fifty dollar two terabyte hard drive and back it up once a night. And then the great thing is, is like if someone takes control of the Surface Pro that I'm on right now, I'll just throw it out. <laughs> you know, and I'll buy a new one. Yeah, yeah. Self-exploding mechanism into the hard drive. I yeah, it's coming. Just, I'll just throw it out, get a new one, and I will reset all of my credentials. And it's like the whole thing. Never, and then reload all yeah. of my data, and it's like the whole thing never happened. Right, 100%. Uh, I love the role you're doing because lawyers are so well-suited to oversee and run point on these kind of things and bringing in all the pieces of the puzzle that are required. And I, the sign of a good professional, in my mind, and you're displaying it fully here, is that you have the humility to recognize where your expertise ends and you need to bring yes. in other people to assist. And I love that about you and your whole mentality through this, uh, this game. So if anybody's um, listening to this and wants to talk to you more or, or contact your firm, how can, how can they get in contact with you? The, um, the easiest way is just to shoot me an email. Um, that's usually the best at Sarah, S-A-R-A-H at Alexander Signs, A-L-E-X-A-N-D-E-R-S-I-D-E-S.com. That's the best way. And then when I get an email, I respond. It's always got my cell. I'm on the phone a lot. Uh, so sometimes I tell a lot of clients, just text me. Uh, I uh, wish I could. Yeah, I wish I could give a desk phone, but I'm so rarely at my desk and usually at a client site that I <laughs> answer it very often. Yeah. But um, that's the best mm -hmm. way to reach me. But I, yeah, I appreciate it. And I, I encourage other lawyers to get involved. Um, yeah, most definitely. most definitely. It's not as scary as you think because you're a lawyer as well, correct? Formerly, I'm not licensed, but I went to law school and I practiced for six years, but not since 2010. So, yeah. uh, but I, you know, my, my background is so relevant to forensics and, and working with lawyers all the time. It's, it's such a great fit for me and, and the clients love it. And, you know, it's that I may not be up to date on the, the current uh, law in, you know, the cases in Canada or the U.S., but you can spot those issues and know, you know, you need to talk to somebody who's an expert in that area. And so 
I absolutely love what I do and it's a, it's a great fit for me. So I'm really blessed to have found the field. Um, but yeah, no, for sure. And um, yeah, definitely for people who follow you on LinkedIn, you're, you're very active on LinkedIn and uh, your blog as well. So I'll link to everything in the, uh, in the notes here. Uh, congratulations, Sarah, on your success and continued success in the field. You're doing a wonderful job. And uh, yeah, it was a real pleasure to finally um, connect with you. We've been trying to set this up for a couple months, but because I'm so busy, I, I, I tend to reach out and, and hook you up with an appointment and then forget to actually schedule it. So no, I appreciate I, your patience with me. No, and that's why we thats why we need more lawyers and more practitioners, you know, people who can really, I call them operators, people who can really get in there and not be afraid to give it a shot. Uh, this is not a four-year degree program kind of, kind of field. It's something that you just sort of have to, sink or swim and you're going to swim. You know, so I try to tell people you will swim. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks again for your time, sir. And have a wonderful day and uh, keep doing what you do. Great. Thank you so much, Tyler. It's great to meet you. You too. All the best. Right, bye. Well, thank you. That was wonderful. I could have